Hey everyone, welcome back to our weekly futures, forex, and stocks outlook. John Henry here, Slingshot Futures Trading Group. I hope you all had a fantastic extended weekend. Before we jump on in, make sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to click on the notification bell too, so you're notified every time a video comes out. If you have any topics you would like covered in a video, drop it in the comments below. And if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email, jhb at ssftg.com. So jumping in this week, starting off on the S&P, uh, and the markets as a whole have seen a pretty good pullback. Uh, we're finally getting a little bit of a dip back down again. We, we've kind of created a situation where the spike and channel that formed earlier broke out higher. And after that, it really didn't give us any information for a long time. It just looked like it was kind of consolidating and not really doing a whole lot until the market jumped up over here and that confirmed the top of that larger spike and channel move, right? We've got the spike up and now we've got the very obvious spike and channel higher where the market is pulling back. Now, if we look at the other pullbacks, really the only other one that's even comparable is the one that happened back in kind of June in that area uh, from top to bottom. In terms of size, nothing else really is kind of that close. All of these are relatively small or, or non-existent, really. They more, more went sideways than pulled back. So now that we're starting to come into the realm of similarity, uh, kind of taking note of how deep that last move down was, coming into alignment with how deep projecting it forward could be on this time uh, for the S&P would be right back at previous structural support, right back at the channel bottom. Everything's kind of stacking up for support uh, to line up right around, uh, looks like around 3,300. So as far as support goes, the 3,300 area is going to be a pretty big one. Uh, looking below that, if it does want to pull back a little bit further, actually get some halfway decent movement to the downside, uh, then looking for breaks of that 3,300 down to 31, 36, 75, or even down back to 3,000, retesting that big, big psychological level to see if that market wants to get a little bit of a bounce right back up again. So far, we are seeing a drive lower and we're seeing an increase in volume dramatically uh, compared to what we have been seeing so there's definitely some moving and shaking right now it's just a matter of how far this market wants to go so far it looks like downside targets aren't necessarily achieved but buyers have been pretty aggressive the whole way up maybe this is all they're able to get i would really love to see that deeper dip down to 3000 though next up jumping over to the nasdaq uh very similar situation of course to all of the other indexes, it's pulling back. What a shock. Um, but a couple things that obviously come into play here, the NASDAQ is at massive highs. It's gone through the roof parabolic. So noting that we have a pretty steep overshot on the top of the channel, usually what ends up happening with that large of a kind of a, an overdone move on the highs will be an exaggerated move on the lows. Uh, and that is usually where the market finds a bottom and starts trying to push back up again. So that looks like it's going to be a little bit around sub 11,000s. I've uh, got some really good support coming in the 10,587s uh, all the way down to the 10,000s. So there's plenty of room for buyers to be coming in here uh, even a little bit ahead of that with some of these unfilled gaps that they could potentially use to try to flip the market back up but for right now realistically it makes more sense that sellers try to push the market down just a little bit further you're not necessarily looking for a huge drive down but there's nothing really else comparable the only other pullback that we had was well I guess the crash, right? I mean, it, the NASDAQ never really pulled back after that. It dipped down with everything else, and then it was just off to the races, all-time highs and all-time highs and all-time highs. So with that kind of movement to the upside, we really don't have a comparable pullback aside from this one, uh, which gives us measured movement down if we're looking at kind of a rinse and repeat, back down sub 11,000, right around that same zone, or potentially even a little bit deeper uh, in towards the 9,000s, which could be a very interesting slide off. Uh, but that's kind of the way that this is looking right now. It seems like there's quite a bit more downside movement potential to go. Uh, it, though there are obviously going to be some bounces along the way. We've got rising channel support, there are unfilled gaps that are looking to get filled, previous swing lows getting bounced off of. The NASDAQ, remember, is a massively bullish market. Buyers want in on this, 
and this is the first time it's really pulled back. So this is going to be a little bit of a, a different one. It's either going to pull back nice back towards those deeper levels, or we're going to start seeing the bottom of this channel supported on this heavy volume that's coming in and then show even more strength to the upside. And we could be gearing up for a move all the way up to those 13,500s. Just absolutely nuts, the potential on the NASDAQ. Jumping over to the Dow, little bit of a mixed bag here. The Dow did start catching up with the other markets, and that was one thing that we've been kind of talking about and how, you know, it's it's not really going. Well, it finally did go, and man, did it start running. Uh, but we haven't broken those all-time highs yet. It still hasn't popped above, uh, giving us that new clean high into that obvious kind of major zone, 30,000. Uh, it's just kind of waiting there above if we can get through this 29,000s. Uh, we are pulling back off of a potential measure move completion but again they fell a little bit short everything is kind of showing that the Dow might have a little bit more room to go than some of the other markets and maybe being kind of the slow one to the party is going to be its advantage because now it's not really needing to pull back it's been cheap everything else is pulling back to cheap now the Dow's got a chance to really start potentially rocket shipping to the upside and who knows, maybe the Dow is the next hot topic market and we see the Dow all the way up above 30,000 and <laughs> going crazy like we see with the NASDAQ. Realistically, that's kind of the situation where either uh, sellers are holding off the highs very aggressively, trying to keep sellers from getting the, or trying to keep buyers rather from getting those fresh all-time highs. Uh, and if they are successful, then this could potentially fall apart all the way down to 21,000, back to 20,000, which would be a pretty big dump uh, comparable to what we saw well a little while ago. Actually, it'd be kind of a rinse and repeat at that point. So it's very important that if buyers are going to try to take over and they are going to be kind of the, the late one to the party uh, that really hits the rocket boosters, they're going to need to show up and not let this slide down very far. Uh, I don't think buyers would really want to see it start dipping underneath 25000 by much, maybe 24487 if it's really going to pull back. But beyond that, if it starts dipping below those 24000s and they're still pushing, there's a very good chance we see that larger pullback back into that zone of interest. Just have to wait and see how extended this leg goes. Volume is kicking up to some serious levels. The micro NASDAQ was pushing almost 2 million contracts last week. Absolutely insane volume. Uh, so the markets are, they're going crazy. Whether this move down is just buyers accumulating volume or whatever it is, there's a lot of volume hitting it. Uh, very interested to see what it has in store for us, especially on the Dow. And finally, jumping over to gold, very kind of consolidated and constricted. Seems like we kind of had a bit of a blow off on the highs there when it jumped above the 2000 area, uh, rallied almost all the way up to 2100. And now we're starting to back back off. And I think some of that euphoria is starting to back off a little bit and people are realizing, wait a minute, <laughs> that, that might have been a little bit too aggressive. Uh, and typically what usually happens at least is seeing buyers getting a little bit suckered in. We have a big giant rally up that's not necessarily sustainable. We're seeing sellers hold true to the movement down. Uh, buyers are obviously buying low, otherwise we'd see it be going down. There's a huge amount of accumulation going on down here. But as soon as the market goes right back up again, we're seeing falling resistance beginning to form too, where sellers are pushing back down. So buyers are likely taking profit a little bit quicker. Sellers are getting a little bit more aggressive in what that would lead to is a breakdown for a quick trap low. And that quick trap low would be a completion of a lot of things. You see a lot of arrows in here. You've got a measured move completion down for the larger one. You've got a smaller measured move completion down. Everything stacking up in the same zone, not to mention previous massive structure. Uh, everything is leveling out to be around a blow off. Seeing the sellers push quick flush and then bounce right back up, that's going to be kind of the desired result of that move down for buyers. And if that's the case, then and although we might have to deal with some resistance here, uh, you know, on the back side of that earlier channel, upside projections would be back to new highs back above 2100. 
the big thing that we need to see here is good buying support that comes in as soon as we start dipping down in here. If they if they just chop through this area, then it's going to be bombs away. If the buyers can't come in quick to save it, uh, then we're looking at deeper dips all the way down to you know 1650s. But we'll cross that bridge if we have to. I won't worry about it that far down, hopefully yet. But <laughs> we'll see where this wants to go. Best support coming in at around the 1900s, a little bit below it. I would like to see that trap low underneath that previous swing, and then buyers can try to push that move right back up. All right, now jumping over to the Forex side, we've got the Euro USD coming in first, and right now still just kind of forming that same spike and channel continuation move. Initially, we had the spike up into a flag, and that had a beautiful breakout, and now we've got a spike into uh, a spike and channel move, and that is kind of usually where they're going to get that bigger move pullback. Uh, now, as far as previous zones of interest, obviously there's a lot of resistance that was there, and when it broke above that, it just left a wide open door. There's not a whole lot inside there, uh, which usually means that the market's going to want to come back and fill in some of that volume that was maybe missed on that breakout move, and that gives us support right back at the previous area of structure. And we've got that support at 1.15309 down to 1.13969. Realistically, it would be nice to see anything just below uh, some of this 1.7 area. Get a nice little flush down, that would make it even nicer. The big thing is, right now, every time the buyers make a new high near that 1.2, it just gets sold right back down again. And as soon as they tested it, man, what a gigantically bearish candle. Uh, huge rejection off of that. So I think buyers are honestly a little bit skittish. They're, they're kind of... <laughs> nobody really wants to buy way up here if every time it goes up, it just gets slapped back down again. The one big thing that buyers do have going for them is that they're making higher highs. They're still making higher highs and higher lows, and everything is still hunky-dory in terms of a trend. But if we start cracking through this low with a decent amount of conviction, that's where that deeper pullback is going to start sparking in. If the buyers do hold this movement up, you can see it's obvious that buyers are trying to pump the brakes here. We're pushing down big wicks on the bottom, and we're closing way up on top of the candle. Uh, it, there's some brake pumping going on. The buyers are saying, whoa, whoa, wait a minute here. There's some support. Let's, we're, we're okay. We're still interested. Just chill a little bit, okay? We're coming back into that support, and buyers are obviously pushing back a bit. Uh, and if we can close out a really strong bull bar reaction, then maybe they've got the strength to break through these highs and get above that 1.2. Uh, but for right now, it seems like buyers are just trying to buy low in hopes that we get a little bit more movement up, and that usually means a deeper pullback if they can't support it up here. Next up, we've got the dollar yen. This poor, poor, poor thing is so sideways and consolidated. We had that initial whip sawing going on in February, March, but since then, it's just been super consolidated and not really going anywhere. Uh, it hasn't even really broken above the highs or lows. So knowing that we have a little bit of constriction here, we're probably going to see a breakout on one side or another. As far as which side breaks down, you could argue either way. Buyers have an argument. Sellers have an argument. It doesn't really matter to me which way they go. I honestly don't care. To me, we're in the middle of a range, and the last thing I want to be doing here is trading anything. Uh, I'm waiting for the extremes, see where those breakouts go, and then usually fade those breakouts, because the first attempt breaking out of anything typically doesn't work so well. Uh, so the way that I'm looking at it right now on the dollar yen is we've just got a range that's on the move a little bit. We're kind of moving down a little bit, but overall it's creating just one large range. And if we can get a dip underneath, we've got support at 104.029 or 104.03, uh, and then a little bit lower down to the 103. And just realistically, 104 to 103 to make it easy is that big zone of support. If the market wants to go a little bit further up and start rallying into zones of interest, 109.5 up to 110.5 is the zone up there. Either way, we need to see a move up or a move down before this gets interesting because where it is, uh, there's not a whole lot uh, going on other than maybe just really shallow couple day holds, buying quick scalps below the lows, hanging on for a little while for a bounce back up. That's about all it's offering up right now. But if we can get some larger moves out of here, then things could start rocking and rolling. Finally, for the Forex side of things, the pound dollar last up on the list and the big thing that's really going on here is a, <laughs> a huge pin bar on the highs. Holy cow, what, what a massive rejection off the top. 
they did miss a new high, right? It did not make a new high. You'll notice if I draw a parallel line, that was a miss. It's kind of hard to see. It was so close. Near miss lower highs. And the big thing to note here is really such a massive rejection on the highs, you would think that sellers would be a little bit stronger. But as soon as it starts dipping back, we're seeing big wicks on the other side too. So buyers are still very aggressively trying to eat this back up, looking for that potential breakout. And this, in that case, might just be a quick little probe, test the waters, and then hammer the top of it and get a really nice uh, kind of rip off the top. So buyers are still not necessarily to be counted out yet. Uh, but if they don't really start making up some ground sooner than later, getting some nice bull response back up above the 1.34s, then we're probably going to see a larger correction back down to previous structural support. The most obvious spot is back to that 1.28. We can get a little bit underneath that. There was definitely some back and forth that could be utilized inside there too, around 1.26. Uh, but the big thing here is seeing what the follow through on this most recent rejection is. Did the buyers follow through back up or or do they lose their ground and we start seeing them slip back lower and we actually start plotting some halfway decent bear bars. If we can get a strong bear bar close after some of this brake pumping going on here, that's usually where the buyers will start giving up saying, wait a minute, well, I was, I was buying it because all the other buyers on this wick, but now you're starting to close down with these big heavy bear bars? Yeah, no thanks. And everybody starts giving up and that's where you get that larger correction back down. Definitely on the radar for a potential move. We'll just have to see what the pound dollar wants to do near the these highs. All right, and then over on, on the stock side of things, first up is Intel, symbol INTC, that's India November Tango Charlie. Uh, the big thing that we've got going for Intel, well, first off, we're sitting on top of $50. Big psychological level. People love big levels like that $50, $25, $75, the big, you know, glorious $100 marks, the $10 marks, all of those. Uh, but 50 is a really nice spot that buyers can potentially buy in because we did come off of highs into the 70s. So it's not necessarily a half-off sale by any means, but realistically, we're finally pulling back. The big thing with the tech sector is that it's been just ripping away, just flying. And this is one of the markets that's not necessarily flying up. Now, that could be a red flag. So, you know, in terms of longer term holds, well, you know, maybe do a little more due diligence in terms of company strength. But as far as the short term goes, we do obviously have some rising support and buyers are buying deep. There's a huge amount of accumulation going on down here. And that gap down with that much volume, uh, I mean, look back on the timeline. We haven't seen that much volume in a long time, so there's obviously some interest going on here on Intel, and usually seeing the interest coming in and the market's response is, well, up. Chances are we're looking for a little more continuation higher uh, in the near, to, honestly, near to potentially long term from a swing perspective. Uh, looking really, really nice on Intel. The big thing that we have to see right now looking in the nearer term is after this big gap down, the market did try to break out above the highs and that high was treated as resistance, very aggressive resistance. Now we are starting to dip back down to where it consolidated for a while and it seems like buyers might be trying to pick it up, but this big heavy bear bar here is going to be pretty hard to push back against. We're going to need to see some buyers conviction before this really starts it's taking off, but if they can show up to the party, there's a potential much larger move ready to fire off. Next up on the radar, we've got CRM, that's Salesforce. Uh, don't ask me how they got CRM, but that's uh, Charlie, Romeo, Mike. And big thing here, obvious if you couldn't tell from the chart, there's a big old gap up. And that gap up wasn't just a small gap up and no response. It was a big heavy gap up with a gargantuan bull bar. Now, the follow through on the highs pretty garbage, right? Nobody's going to be that enticed by seeing that week of follow through and seeing it fi finally try to break out higher and then we're starting to down gap. There's some obvious issues here buying at the top and nobody was interested and we're seeing the market pull back. But typically when you start pulling back to the bottom of where that gap comes in, especially noting that it's at a gigantic psychological level like 250, uh, again, those 250s, 300s, 350s, those half marks, uh, we're sitting right on top of that at that low. We're seeing big brake pumps going on here again, big wicks on the bottom of CRM, uh, and buyers are definitely fighting over this low. And as long as they can hold it, there's a very good chance that we see back up to those highs and potentially higher towards 300s as sellers start giving up. 
If the sellers can maintain a little bit more pressure, get a little bit more of a slide down, then we've got big support down at 230.72, down to 213.98. Relatively wide zone, uh, but that would be coming back to fill in some of those gaps. Maybe a little bit lower if it wants a really quick wick flush. Get one of those quick emergency you know, news announcements that turns out to be false kind of things. Uh, fill in some of that info down there and then pop right back up again would be nice. Uh, but that's kind of the outlook right now. Buyers are definitely definitely fighting over the lows. They're trying to buy the dip uh, and looking for a more continuation up. And here again, if you look at the volume side of things, we haven't seen this kind of volume in a very long time. Well, arguably, I mean, all the way back to 2015, it might, might as well be ever. Uh, it just, we're seeing some massive volume coming in on this dip and buyers are obviously buying the pullback. It's just a matter of if there's enough oomph to keep it going back to the highs or if we're going to see a little bit of a deeper dip. And then finally, we've got VRA in kind of combination with JWN. Now, VRA, that's Vera Bradley. Uh, we've got a huge, absolutely monstrous earnings beat. They beat it by 584, almost 585%. And we see those kind of numbers all the time. You know, oh, a company beating their earnings by, you know, a bajillion percent. Sweet, cool, congrats. You know, it was a negative number that turns out to be positive. But realistically, when you're seeing big earnings beats, big gaps up, big bull bars closing very high, right? It's closing in its upper third easily, potentially even in, in its upper quarter. And on top of that, it's backed up by massive industrial buying supporting the move. Again, zooming out, we haven't seen that kind of volume ever. <laughs> and all of a sudden, now we're jumping back up. There is obviously a little bit of a concern. It's a very cheap stock, right? We're talking sub tens. This is where things get a little bit weird. Potential bag holders previously trying to buy the breakout above that 750 going into $8 mark. They got dumped on and they've been holding on to it in the fours for a really long time. That looks like where the base of accumulation kind of took place. So the next thing is, are the buyers going to be able to break above it this time around? Or do we need to go into a little bit of consolidation? Seeing a little bit of press back from the sellers, but the buyers came right back in again. So seeing a little bit more follow through here, seeing them break above it and, you know, not immediately pull back. Some good conviction here. Or even better yet would be a small little stalling pattern. Let the market kind of go sideways a little bit here, form a nice little pennant, and then get a great breakout to the upside. That could potentially propel it all the way up through 10. Um, but right now, just looking for a little bit of of kind of conviction. We're testing a big area. These are where previous people have been potentially bag holding for a while. It's back. Now, are they going to want to keep it going or are we going to see this just fall right back down on itself uh, and then we see it collapse back through four? Now, the reason I say in combination with JWN is because, well, JWN is, is Nordstrom's and they sell Vera, so that's kind of a, a natural one-in-one -one play. But if we look at them together, VRA, in comparison to JWN, they have a very, very similar market pattern uh, where we see a huge amount of consolidation going on here and buyers are picking it up. And that's around that $14 area. Now, that's probably purely coincidence that it's 14 and it's four over here, but it is kind of creepy sometimes when those types of things happen. And they're hovering right around that same area with a really good amount of support. It wouldn't be a surprise at all to see VRA propel JWN a little bit further up if we can get some good news from some of the other big brands that they sell to kind of kick it back up towards that $20 mark, maybe start filling in some of these gaps up here and potentially start filling in some of this unfinished business all the way back up into the mid 40s. Lots of potential on both VRA and JWN, really kind of hinging on VRA as well as several of the other brands that Nordstrom carries uh, that has a large impact on it kind of doing well. We want to see good, good movement. It's cool that VRA is doing well in terms of earnings and all that fun stuff, but we got to see some other ones come in too if we're going to see Nordstrom's lift higher. VRA is a nice play by itself. I would love to see some consolidation JWN is just kind of an extra side note uh, to definitely keep our eyes on. 
All right, well, that's going to do it for this one. Hopefully, you've had a great extended weekend. Hopefully, you've had some time to rest up and kind of get ready for this week. It's going to be a short one, but it's usually a pretty fun one. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Everyone's kind of getting back to business. Kids are going back to school, or maybe you became a, uh, a homeschool teacher now, and <laughs> you've got to deal with that. It's going to be an interesting one. We'll see how it all goes. But these are some good times in terms of market movement uh, going back into you know September, October. Things start getting pretty fun. So uh, definitely buckle up and get ready. If it's already been interesting, it hopefully just gets better, right? Uh, so that's going to do it. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email, jhb at ssftg.com. Until the next one, have a good one, and we will see you all later. Thanks.